Welcome, friends of the science of ADHD. This is Russ Barkley, back again with another commentary, this time focusing on, pun intended, neuroglasses, a new device claiming to help treat inattention in ADHD teens and adults. I want to thank a colleague in Israel, Alexander Moskowitz, for bringing this product to my attention. I had seen the original study about these neuroglasses published about a year and a half ago in Frontiers in Psychiatry, but I didn't think much of it because it was a pretty poorly done study. But nonetheless, he has brought it back to my attention and asked me to take another look at this because it's being marketed in his country and possibly elsewhere as well. So I went back and took a look at the product and some of the um, product information as well as the original study. And let's go into this product to see what we can learn about does it help improve ADHD symptoms. Let me bring up my PowerPoint here and we'll have a look. So this is what the neuroglasses look like. I've blown up the image taken from the original paper in Frontiers in Psychiatry, which I'll show to you in just a moment. But I did this in order for you to see what this device is all about. Here we see a pair of eyeglass frames. There are lenses in there. Uh, the lenses are not designed to treat eye problems. Uh, any individuals in the study who had need for corrective vision had their lenses adjusted to their prescription level strength. But what I want to point out here is for you to take a look at the lenses specifically, and you can see that there are small little windows which uh, right here look to be shaded, uh, and that in these windows are presented stimuli at various rates and various strengths, I believe. Nonetheless, these are distracting elements that are being presented in the peripheral visual field, and it is believed that by doing so, one can enhance the concentration of the individual with ADHD. By the way, the trade name for this device is called Sparkles, at least as it's being marketed right now. But in the article, it's referred to as neuroglasses. So uh, what is the research on distractors and ADHD? So let's back up a moment and look at the broader research field on what is going on here. I have studied distractors with ADHD throughout my career in various neuropsychological studies. Uh, as have others as well. And what have we learned? Well, believe it or not, distractors may help with concentration under some circumstances. So far, the principal distractors that have been looked at have been either visual or auditory. It would be interesting to look at whether or not tactile or oral stimulation, such as through taste distractors or smell distractors, had the same effects. But right now, uh, it's primarily limited to these two forms of sensory stimuli. The second thing that we have learned is that it depends on the location of the distracting stimulus. If it's embedded within the task materials themselves, it might just help with performance of that task. On the other hand, if it's peripheral to the task, meaning it's really not part of the task at all, but just in the surrounding environment, it actually can worsen performance. So uh, it really is going to depend on where the distractor is presented. As you saw in the eyeglasses, they're actually within the lenses themselves. So they are within the focus of attention. In other words, they're embedded within whatever task the individual with ADHD is doing. It also depends on the degree of inattentiveness. Some studies, including my own, found that if you presented distractors to those with ADHD, it did help to some extent them to concentrate on the lab task that we were doing. On the other hand, if you presented the distractor to typical people, it either did not help them very much, if at all, and in some cases actually proves to be detrimental to their task performance. So remember, if you think of attention as kind of a bell curve, it really depends on where on the bell curve you are. If you're below average, then these distractors might help to raise your level of arousal, alertness, and focus of attention. But if you're already in the zone of optimal performance, then it's possible that increasing 
distractors by further increasing attention and arousal actually detracts from task performance. Also, research shows that it depends on the kind of task that the individual is doing and the cognitive load or effort that the task requires. The research, what little has been done on this, does seem to suggest that the distractors are not helpful if the task has a low cognitive load, is not novel but relatively routine, and fairly boring. The distractors not only don't matter, but they might actually worsen attention in people who are already inattentive. On the other hand, if the task they're doing has a certain level of demand or cognitive load or effort required, and it's also novel, then the distracting stimuli presented within the task might actually help to improve performance again mainly in those who are already inattentive. So that's kind of what we know about the value of distractors for task performance in those with ADHD. Now, let's take a look at the single study that was done on this topic. Okay, so there's only one study. I'm gonna get out of my PowerPoint for just a moment and show you that study. It's right here, it was published over in Frontiers in Psychiatry about a year and a half ago. And you can see the authors of the paper are Yael Richter et al. Uh, and the title is A Novel Intervention for Treating Adults with ADHD Using Peripheral Visual Stimulation. I just want to give you a few details about the study. It involved 97 adults and they were given these glasses to wear, requested to wear them about two hours every day over a period of two months. And then these adults were provided with certain tests in a lab environment before and after the two month period. And then they were also asked to complete ratings of their ADHD symptoms and executive functioning. There was also a rather crude clinical improvement scale, known as the CGI, that was given at the endpoint, which basically assesses how much do you think the device, or in this case, the treatment, helped the individual. Often that's filled out by a clinician who is interviewing the patient. So we've got 97 participants, as it says here, who are going through this particular trial, right? So it's a pre-post design. You fill out the measures before, and then you fill them out two months later, and during that time, you're exposed to the intervention. Now, uh, what did this study find? Uh, it claims to have found some significant improvements in ADHD inattention and the domain of executive functioning known as metacognition, which by the way, is highly correlated with measures, or excuse me, ratings of inattention, so no surprise there. And then, on a continuous performance test done in the lab, there was some improvement in detectability of signals in the task and a reduction in commission errors. By the way, when we look at the degree of improvement, uh, they were mild to moderate in nature. And indeed, on other measures that were collected in the study, such as ratings of hyperactivity, ratings of impulsivity, on the executive functioning measures, of course, there is inhibition, emotion regulation, behavioral regulation, and so on. And on the lab task, there are measures of impulsivity as well as inattention. And there appeared to be no improvements other than those I've already noted here on these other measures. As they say, no positive effects uh, on response inhibition. So, um, excuse me, uh, there was a positive effect on the commission errors, but not on other ratings of inhibition. My apologies there. They claimed that there were no major adverse events that were reported, but there were some adverse events. So give me just a moment to scroll down here to where they report those adverse events. There's a picture of the glasses that comes from uh, this particular article. And let's have a look at the kinds of problems that people reported in the study. Okay, it's right here, excuse me, and, oh, wait just a second. Uh, let's see, that's the usage. There it is, right there. Okay, I'm gonna try to increase the focus of this. 
Okay, so that we can have a look at this. And what do we see? Under reports of safety and tolerability, about 65 of the 94 adults reported some adverse event. Uh, the most common was headache, 36 reported that, eye strain, dizziness, tiredness, discomfort, visual discomfort, nausea, and feeling hyper. And that was a very rare event, about one out of 100. Nonetheless, again, about 65% of those completing the trial reported some adverse event. But notice that they're not serious, they're not severe, there's no threat to the safety of the individual, mainly the side effects might be considered by people to be annoying. So, okay, there you have the study. It's just one study. Now, let's go back to my PowerPoint and let's take a look at what's wrong with this study. First of all, it's just one. We hardly call that a body of evidence regarding the effectiveness of a treatment. Second, it was done by and funded by the manufacturer of the device. So we have to be concerned about conflict of interest here, don't we? In addition, the study is purely a pre-post design. As textbooks on scientific designs will tell you, this is the weakest kind of design for testing a hypothesis among all of the designs that we have. And that is because it does not control for a variety of confounding factors. It's basically one step above a collection of anecdotes. So it's a, it's a pretty darn bad design for testing a treatment. In addition, there is no control group. So the fact that you tested people before and after they did the intervention really doesn't mean much to me or to any other scientist because we need to compare that to people who got a control group, either a weightless control or better yet, individuals who got a similar kind of treatment that didn't involve the critical element of the distraction. This would be known as a placebo or a sham treatment control. There's no such control here. So in other words, there's no control for the attention the individual got from the clinicians in the study uh, or the, the staff in the study. There's no control for time, for effort, for the discussions that may have taken place during the evaluations, which can be therapeutic in and of themselves. Uh, there's no control for the wearing of the device itself. So there's just a lot going on here that's confounding the interpretation of the study that a good study design would have tried to control for. This did not. In addition, there's no blinding of the raters. You're simply asking the adult, so what do you think? And they're filling out some scales of what happened before and after, but no effort to blind the individuals from who got the real treatment and who got the placebo or the sham treatment. Now, sometimes that's difficult to do in a study like this, but it's not impossible. They could have had ratings from others who know the patient well and had them fill out the same ratings about whether or not they saw improvements in the individuals, but no matter. Now, the other difficulties with a pre-post study design uh, happen to deal with practice effects. There are known practice effects on all of the measures used in this study. To put it another way, if I gave these measures to adults with ADHD, didn't do anything, and gave them a week, two weeks, or a month, or two months later, there would be a decline in the scores. And that has to do with the individual being now more familiar with the ratings or the measures, having done them previously as well. So the <clears throat> novelty of them has changed and we often see improvement from pre to post. So anytime you see a study that involves that kind of design using measures like this, the first thing we look at is there's probably a practice effect and the manufacturer or the authors are taking credit for the practice effect when they should not. So it would have been better to have had a control group that completed the same measures over the same time. Now, as I said, there were no assessments of the clients through others who know them well. There were, I think, some clinician uh, ratings, but they're rather crude and global having to do with uh, the perceived improvement in the patient's 
over this two-month period. The tests that we use are not ecologically valid. We know that a continuous performance test, while it's often used to measure inattention and impulsivity, correlates with no measures of ADHD symptoms in the typical environment. You've heard me talk about this before. These neuropsychological tests have little or no ecological validity. And while the ratings have ecological validity, those are confounded by the fact that they're given several times, there's no control groups, and so on. So we have to take those with a grain of salt as well. The effects were limited to the measures and ratings of inattention. Notice, no improvement on any of the other symptoms. Hyperactivity, impulsivity, emotion regulation, working memory, and so on. Those either did not improve or simply were not assessed in the study. So uh, the effects are fairly limited and, as I said, are pretty much of a mild to moderate degree, if that. There is a limited duration of the lab task that's measuring the symptoms. The lab task only takes about 15 to 20 minutes, so it's possible that these distractors presented in the lenses might improve task performance for a while, but then might lose their effectiveness due to habituation to the stimuli. They're no longer novel. They're no longer interesting in the sense that they help to activate arousal and focus and alertness. The individual basically may come to ignore them. So we don't know how long the effect of these distractors lasts and as far as I know, I haven't seen any research study look at that beyond the initial parameters of the testing period itself, which is pretty short, don't you think? Okay, there were some side effects that were reported, and they were reported by the majority of people. So although there's no real concern here about safety of the individuals, there is some concern that the uh, glasses could be annoying. And this may help to explain why over the two and a half year follow-up period, 53% of the people who were provided these glasses were no longer using them. And the predominant reason given for discontinuation was ineffectiveness, about 79% or so. So while the retention rate over the two months that they followed people was about 80% continued to use the devices, over two, point, over two years, three months, I believe it was, they stopped using it in the majority of individuals. So there you have it, about a 20% discontinuation rate over one month and 53% over about two, that should be 2.3 years, by the way. So there you have it. That's what we know about these glasses and whether or not they help people with ADHD. It's possible they may help it, help them to a limited degree when they're doing certain tasks uh, and over short periods of time. So we can't rule that possibility out. But on the other hand, this study cannot be taken as evidence for the effectiveness of the intervention for all of the reasons that I've pointed out here. So time will tell whether this device is helpful to those with ADHD. By the way, as an aside, there was a study reported by the company in their marketing materials that was done with teenagers. The study has not been published or peer reviewed. In the marketing materials, they report that the teens did report some improvement. However, if you look more closely at the data presented there, there were no statistically significant effects of the intervention on the, I think it was about 32 or so teens used in that study. So that really can't be taken as evidence of effectiveness for the teens, uh, given the limitations we've already talked about in these kinds of studies and given the statistics that were actually reported there. So uh, at this point, I'm going to reserve judgment. I'm not sure whether these glasses are helpful or not, but I can say at this point, there is no compelling or convincing scientific evidence from this single study that neuroglasses or sparkles help to treat ADHD. Thanks for joining me for this particular commentary. I really appreciate it. If you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing. If you know some people who might benefit from watching this channel, please recommend it to them. I really appreciate that. In the meantime, as I always say, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now. Thank you.